All right, welcome biologists. Today we're gonna talk about the scientific study of life. The objectives for this lecture are to demonstrate an understanding of the scientific process and logical reasoning. You should be able to describe the basic assumptions in science and explain why correlation does not imply causation. You should be able to demonstrate an understanding of how living things differ from non-living and never living things. Identify the attributes of living things and differentiate living from non-living and never living. So first, let's talk about why science is reliable. Well, it, it's because we utilize the scientific method, which I know you've all heard of before, but we'll review the steps. So the scientific method begins with an observation. We notice something about the natural world. So if you've ever taken a walk through a field or a meadow where there's goldenrod, you may have noticed that some, but not all, of the plants in the field have these galls on them, like these round spherical balls near the top of the plant. What are those? So you start with an observation and a question. What is this? Next, you do a literature review, or this is what, like in layman's terms, most people call research. And research in science means something different, right? That's when you're employing the entirety of the scientific method. But when you're looking to see what we already know about a subject, that's called a literature review. So you're gonna do a literature review of your topic area. So what do we already know about this phenomenon? Well, we know that the galls are caused by an insect. Insects lay their eggs inside the tissue of the plant and it causes the plant to grow this gall, this circular structure, spherical structure around the egg. So next we need to develop a hypothesis. If the galls are caused by insects, I wonder if there's a cost to the plant. Is it bad for the plants to have these galls on them? So your hypothesis might be something like goldenrod plants with the galls produce less floral mass than those without, right? The whole point of a plant that flowers is to produce flowers so that it can reproduce, right? So if there's a cost, maybe we'd see it there in the flowers. Next, we're gonna test our hypothesis. How could you test this? A hypothesis that goldenrod plants with the galls have less floral mass than those without galls. So pause for a minute, think about how you might gather data to help you address this hypothesis. Well, you'd have to design an experiment well-designed experiments include a sample size, so the number of subjects in a group. How many plants would you need to, to measure the flowers on to know that you've studied enough? Independent variable is what's manipulated. So in this case, what's manipulated is the presence or the absence of the galls, right? The dependent variable is the thing that the scientist measures. So in this case, the mass of the flowers. A standardized variable would be things that are held constant for all subjects. So you might choose flowers all from the same field that are receiving the same amount of sunlight, they're at the same temperature, they get the same amount of water when it rains. So you try and keep everything else constant except for the independent variable. A control group would be the group of test subjects that are left untreated. So this would be like your goldenrod flowers that do not have galls. They would be the control group. The experimental group is the group of test subjects that does receive the treatment. So this would be your goldenrod plants that do have galls. All right, so what you'll need to do is write down in your note-taking guide what the sample size, independent and dependent variables, standardized variables, control and experimental groups are for the goldenrod experiment. All right, so 
let's look at some data. So here we have the mass of flowers from 10 plants that do have galls. And on the right side, we have the floral mass of 10 plants that do not have galls. So we have some data. How do we compare these numbers? Well, we'd use a statistical analysis, right? So in this case, we have a box and whisker plot, which is one statistical tool you can use to compare things. But basically these, oops, where'd my cursor go? The X is in the middle is the average. And then there's these bars above and below. That's the standard deviation. So if these bars don't overlap, so there's a gap between the top of the with gall flower masses and the bottom of the without gall flower masses. Because there's a gap and they don't overlap, we can stay there statistically significantly different. So the floral mass in goldenrods without galls is significantly higher than the floral mass with galls. So do your data support your hypothesis? that goldenrod plants with galls will have less floral mass than those without? Yes, these data support this hypothesis. Good. So next, you need to report your conclusions, right? In science, it doesn't really matter if you solve a major problem, but you don't communicate your findings. So think of like if you developed a cure for COVID, but you didn't tell anyone, have you actually cured COVID? No, <laughs> right? It only works if we can tell people about it. And that's where reporting conclusions is so important. So if the phenomenon you're observing is real, then it should be able to observe, be observed by other scientists in other places. Sometimes a first study of a phenomenon gets a lot of attention in the public media. Do you remember the vaccines cause autism scare? Many scientists around the globe have tried to repeat that study, but no one has ever been able to get similar results. Um, so we know that vaccines do not actually cause autism. And actually, the scientists who published that study did finally come forward and say that they'd fabricated the results. And um, that doctor lost his medical license but it's done an incredible amount of harm, right? How many parents chose not to vaccinate their children because of uh, an unfounded fear that it would cause autism in their children. So the damage had already been done. Many parents are still today even choosing to decline life-saving vaccines because of pseudoscience in the media. So this is something we need to be very conscious of. Pseudoscience is things that sounds like science but it's not truly science right and you see this especially on social media um and that's one of my biggest pet peeves with facebook and youtube is that anybody can put together a well-designed piece of media and it sets um on facebook or youtube or wherever right next to something produced by the CDC or the World Health Organization, um, and it looks to be just as reputable. So with this, um, this pseudoscience is something that we always need to be on the lookout for um, so that we don't fall prey to it. Okay, but back to our goldenrod. So does the presence of a gall cause the goldenrod to produce smaller flowers? So after we've done a good study, usually we should have new questions that our conclusions can generate, right? Our study where we measured flower masses showed that there's some kind of a relationship, a correlation. The two things go together, but that do doesn't necessarily mean that the presence of a gall causes the goldenrod to make smaller flowers. All right, we already talked about statistical tests. All right, um, 
this is a good question for you to do in your own note-taking guides. What's the dependent variable in the experiment outlined in this graph? So this graph, we have time and years on the x-axis. The y-axis, we see the number of deaths from diarrheal disease. Before countrywide vaccination, we see this regular pattern with peaks and valleys that repeats every year, and the number of deaths due to diarrhea is fairly constant over time. After countrywide vaccination begins in 2007, we see dramatic declines, which is awesome. So what is the dependent variable? What's the thing that is being measured by the scientists? Good. It's always on the y-axis. The number of deaths from diarrhea, that's the dependent variable in this study. All right, here I'd like you to pause the video and write down the components of scientific inquiry. What are the steps of the scientific method? How do you address your data to tell if there's a real pattern or difference or not? And what are the different types of variables and groups that should be present in a well-designed experiment? All right, let's continue on for a moment and talk about cause and effect versus correlation. So here's a good example. Global temperatures are increasing, right? We know that average global temperatures are generally higher each year than they have been in the last 200. Um, and it's also true that Taylor Swift is producing more and more music every year. So there's, oops, let's go back. Okay, so does the fact that Taylor Swift is producing more music and the temperature of the earth is going up, it does do you think it's likely that Taylor Swift's hot music is making global temperatures rise? Or they just happen to be occurring at the same time? Right? They just happen to occur at the same time. Correlation. Very good. So just because two things happen to occur in the same place at the same time does not necessarily mean that one causes the other. All right. Um, another good example of this, if we go back to my example with vaccines and autism, is that there's a correlation between autism and vaccines. Most autism is diagnosed in young children, which also happens to be the time in your lives when children are given many scheduled vaccines, right? We want to get kids' immune systems equipped to deal with disease before they encounter them in the real world, which means they need their vaccinations as early as they can get them safely. But correlation does not equal causation. Just because they're happening at the same time doesn't mean that they're related. Just like Taylor Swift is not causing global warming with her hot new songs. They just happen to be occurring at the same time. All right, so when you're doing the part of the scientific method where you're doing a literature review, you're trying to figure out what do we already know about a topic, how can we find good sources of information and avoid pseudoscience? Well, the best place to look is in peer-reviewed scientific literature. So every time a scientist does a study and they report their findings, they report them to a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And this peer review is very important. What it means is that if I do an experiment and I write a paper about it and I want to tell other scientists, I'll submit it to a journal that publishes other studies that are similar to mine. And that journal will send my research paper out to usually three to five other scientists who are experts in the field. And they're going to read my study and see if they think it holds up. Have I designed my experiment well enough? Do my conclusions make sense? Um, and if my study passes peer review, then it can be published. So peer reviewed scientific literature is a good place to find information that's already been vetted 
by the rest of the scientific community, people who know more about that science specifically than you do. There are other good sources of information. Um, certain websites are usually trustworthy sources of information, and these are things that are put together not for profit, but for the public good. So usually things that end in .gov or .edu. These are generally reliable websites. You should be leery of .coms and .orgs. These websites usually have an agenda, like to make a profit or to promote a cause, and, and that agenda is not purely for public education or the public good. Another thing to keep in mind is if an article makes sweeping or shocking claims, it's time to be suspicious. Look for reputable sources to confirm or conflict with this information. So some reliable sources of information are places like the Center for Disease Control, the USDA, EPA, and Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Peer-reviewed scientific studies that have been corroborated and um, something like kent.edu, the Kent State University Environmental Science and Design Institute, something that's a reputable website, a web source. Unreliable sources of information would be links that show up on your social media feeds, publications and opinion news outlets with bias or agenda, and organizations or industries with bias and agenda, right? These are unreliable sources of information. All right, let's shift gears now to biology. Biology itself is the scientific study of life. Life is everywhere, but it can be difficult to define. Biologists study all forms of life, and each individual that's living is called an organism. How do we know that the trees in this image on the left are alive, but the rocks are not? Well, all forms of life share a common set of characteristics, and if something possesses all the characteristics, it's considered alive. If it consider if it if a thing has many but not all of the characteristics, then it's non-living. All right. So, what characteristics do all organisms share? Well, all living things are made of cells, and they have organization to them. All living things require and use energy. All living things work to maintain internal constancy, and we call that homeostasis. All living things reproduce, grow, and develop. And all living things evolve. So, let's spend a little more time on each of these. Cells are the basic units of life. Every organism consists of one or more cells. A simple, single-celled organism is said to be unicellular. The prefix uni means one, right? And if it has more than one, we would say it's multicellular. Life is also organized, so not just within cells, but if we look here, cell is the smallest unit of life, right? Cells work together to form tissues. Tissues work together to form organs. Organs work together to produce organ systems. Organ systems work together to create a functioning organism. Organisms together produce populations. Populations of different species create a community. Different communities and their non-living factors that live around them make up an ecosystem. And the outer shell of the earth where life occurs is called the biosphere. So there's organization both in that all living things are made of cells, but also that we see the same pattern of building complexity as we zoom from cells out to the entire biosphere.
All right, organization leads to emergent properties. And emergent properties are properties that arise at each level of biological organization. Things that um, aren't there at lower levels. So the components interact and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? Like a brain cell can do so much by itself. Brain cells can interact with one another, but all together they make a brain that functions and can produce memory. This is something emergent. It's a new property that a brain is able to do, but brain cells on their own interacting are not. All right, so a comprehension check question here for you. Which of the following statements is false? Organs consist of tissues. Populations consist of organisms. Molecules consist of cells. Organisms consist of atoms. And organelles consist of molecules. See if you can pick it out, which one's false. Good, it's C. Cells are made up of molecules, but molecules are smaller than cells and simpler, right? Good. All right, how about this one? Which is the best example of an emergent property? A quality that results from interactions in a system's components. Stacking cups on top of each other makes a plastic pyramid. Wearing glasses gives you better vision. Welding metal together makes an office building. Wearing clothes keeps you warmer. And tying strings together makes a longer string. Good. Welding metal together makes an office building, right? There was no office building before the metal was welded together. So that makes it an emerging property. All right, so we've talked about organization. Let's move on to energy. All organisms require energy. They use that energy to keep things organized, to carry out chemical reactions, transport molecules in and out of cells, maintaining internal constancy or homeostasis, and they use it to reproduce, grow, and develop. All right, some organisms are able to produce their own energy. These producers are autotrophs. They include plants, some protists, and many prokaryotes. And what they're able to do is harvest energy from the sun. Do you remember what this process is called? Good, photosynthesis, yes. So they, they capture energy from the sun, they convert it into chemical energy that can be used um, by organisms that eat the producer or by the producer itself. Good, and then some of that is broken down by decomposers. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, consumers are organisms that eat producers to get their energy. <coughs> Decomposers get their energy from breaking down dead organisms and waste. Homeostasis is the process by which a cell or organism maintains internal constancy. All right, sorry for that pause. I had to go get a cough job. All right, so we were talking about homeostasis. This is the process by which a cell or an organism keeps their internal environment constant. So, for example, humans have an internal thermostat that helps keep our body temperature the same, right? So when you're shoveling the snow off your driveway in February, your body temperature should be about 98.6. And when you go for a jog in August and it's 95 degrees out, your body temperature is still 98.6, right? 
So we do different things in different environments to keep our internal environment constant, like sweating when it's hot or putting on more layers or a warm coat when it's cold. Homeostasis involves many different aspects of internal constancy. Temperature is just one. It could also be a balance of nutrients, sugar, salt, and water. And this means that organisms need to be able to sense and respond to stimuli in their environment. All right, all living things reproduce, grow, and develop. Reproduction can be asexual. Asexual reproduction is when there's only one parent involved and the offspring are all genetically identical to the parent. It's a successful strategy in unchanging environments. And a good example of this are strawberry plants. If you've ever had strawberries in your garden, you might notice these runners, these shoots that come off of the original plant. And when they touch the soil, they grow a new plant after it. So a well-managed strawberry patch can become quite dense with strawberry plants quickly because of this asexual reproduction. There's also sexual reproduction. This is when there's two parents involved and the offspring are genetically different from both of their parents. It's a successful strategy in changing environments since the offspring are unlike either parent. Most plants and animals reproduce sexually and these young swans receive genetic material from two parents. Both the plantlets and this swan started as a single cell and have grown and developed into multicellular organisms. So which of the following are true about reproduction? Sexual reproduction creates genetic variation. Sexual reproduction is most successful in unchanging environments. Most plants reproduce only asexually. Asexual organisms do not actually reproduce, or E, none of this is true. All right, if you chose A, you're right. Sexual reproduction creates genetic variation among its organisms. Evolution. So all organisms have DNA or RNA. Um, DNA is the molecule that carries genetic information, and it's what's passed on from one generation to the next. All cells use DNA to produce proteins, which carry out the work that cells do. Evolution is a genetic change over time in a population. For example, here we have a cut that becomes infected with bacteria. And over time, a mutation might occur that creates a single bacterium that is resistant to an antibiotic. So this infected cut will be treated with an antibiotic um, and that antibiotic will kill off most of the green organisms that are susceptible to it, but the red ones that have evolved resistance will be able to continue to grow and reproduce. If an antibiotic is not used, then the organisms in that cut will remain mostly not resistant, right? there's a cost to being antibiotic resistant. All right, so this is evolution. It's a genetic change over time in a population. All organisms evolve and different organisms have different genes. So how is it that so many organisms seem perfectly suited to their environments? Well, this pygmy seahorse blends into the coral habitat where it lives because of its genes. Other seahorses with different genes don't blend in as well. It's well hidden from predators, so it survives, reproduces, and passes along its genes for excellent camouflage. The offspring that have the genes that allow them to blend into the environment are more likely to reproduce and have offspring of their own, right? And that's how these traits spread through a population. All right, um, another example here are bacteria. Bacteria reproduce and evolve quickly. They have very short generation times. 
This population here has genetic variation. The red cells have a different gene than the green ones that makes them resistant to antibiotics. If we expose them to an antibiotic, then we select for having more antibiotic resistant organisms, right? And if we don't expose them to an antibiotic, then we're selecting for organisms that are not resistant to that antibiotic. There's no benefit to being antibiotic resistant if there's no antibiotics around. All right, we'll touch more on each of these topics throughout the, throughout the course. What I'd like you to do next is pause the video and create a concept map to connect these terms. Hopefully now, after watching this video, you understand the scientific process and logical reasoning. You can describe basic assumptions in science, explain why correlation does not imply causation. You can demonstrate an understanding of how living things differ from non-living and never living things, right? Non-living would be something like a rock or yeah, never living would be something like a rock. Non-living would be something that's died, right? And is being decomposed. Identify the attributes of living things and differentiate from non-living and never living.